Now, what I'm going to do is introduce all of the individuals who are here today. And then once I conclude with all the introductions, I'm going to begin with Mr. Demario Boone for introduction. First, on my left, please stand up, Demario Boone. <clears throat> Clara Underwood Foreman. Lawrence Michard. Benjamin R. Nix Jr. Anu Udavalu. Mike Vespa. Ladies and gentlemen and those at home, let's get started. Mr. Demario Boone with your opening remarks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Change Peoria, uh, for this debate. My name is Demario Boone. Um, my current title is the Director of School Safety for Peoria Public Schools. Um, I was born and raised on Peoria's South Side. Uh, that's where I spent the first 18 years of my life. Um, graduated the Manual High School and went off to be a Peoria police officer and uh, changed my uh, profession to a Peoria Public School Safety Officer. And the reason I'm running is because of the things that I've saw in those two roles. Um, there was actually a family that uh, reached out to our department for help. And I went to this home and sat on her porch um, until 10 o'clock at night just to uh, 
help this mother. She, the house was in disarray. She was having home issues. Um, she had three or four other children and, and one of her older children, um, had been involved in youth violence and crime. And she just was reaching out for help. Um, so I remember sitting on that porch with her until 10 o'clock at night, talking to her younger children and then waiting for her oldest son to come. And when I spoke to him, uh, he was very honest with me and said, I appreciate what you're doing. Um, but I'm going to stay in the streets. You need to just talk to my younger siblings. Um, this mother reached out for help. I had to try to piecemeal finding services, which is an issue in Peoria because everybody works in silos. So we had to piecemeal trying to help this parent um, with housing, with finances, uh, with mentorship with the kids. Um, fast forward to a couple months uh, after that, um, this parent uh, unfortunately committed suicide um, because of the things that she was overwhelmed with. And I don't think those are the types of things that we need to sit around a horseshoe and debate helping families like this. We don't need to sit around and debate quality of life issues for Peorians. So that's why I'm running for city council at large. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, thank you uh, for being here. Thank you uh, to the host uh, for having me. Uh, my name is Clara Underwood Foreman. Uh, I have lived in Peoria for over 40 years. Uh, I am a candidate for uh, city council at large and just want to put some emphasis on the at large part, uh, which means all of Peoria. Uh, I want to fight for all of Peoria. I've been a pastor uh, here in Peoria for over 20 years and which have afforded me to be able to get into the community and talk to people and find out uh, what their issues are, uh, find out uh, some of the things that they are struggling with. And, uh, and to be able to uh, offer some type of solution or resource uh, for, the, for them to be able to get help. I have been in the community, uh, working uh, in the community, engaged in the community. Uh, and it, you know, it kind of started 20 years ago, uh, which is one of the main parts of my campaign, and that is safety. Uh, 20 years ago, I lost my first son uh, to gun violence. Uh, he was murdered actually in my home. And then in 2015, I lost my last uh, child uh, to gun uh, violence as well. So that's uh, very near and dear to me to be able to do whatever I can uh, do to help uh, families uh, not to go through what I've gone through and those that have to be able to uh, uh, help them to heal uh, in the process. Uh, I'm very excited about what what is going on in our city, uh, excited about you being here because evidently uh, you're excited as well. So thank you so much again for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, my name <clears throat> is Lawrence Michard. And I'm very happy and honored and proud to be here. I want to thank the organizers. This is a great, great outcome. And I want to thank the people here. And I also want to recognize all of the people here at the table. They're all wonderful, wonderful people who are uh, giving of themselves service to the community. And I would be happy with any and all of them on the city council. Um, I'm running as a proud socialist, progressive, pro-labor, LGBTQIA leftist for all Peoria in this April 4th election. Um, especially, I'm running for the marginalized and voiceless residents, primarily in the East Bluff, the North Valley, the South Side, Center Bluff, and all the other neighborhoods that rarely enjoy the full resources and positive attention of City Hall. If elected, I will donate at least half of my city salary and benefits back to local nonprofit organizations. I'm not in this to make any money or to benefit financially. I was born and raised in Peoria. I'm proudly a graduate of Academy Spalding. I went to Illinois State right afterwards, graduated with a degree in English and history. I became a reporter photographer for the uh, for some newspapers in the area, after that, and 
I've been gone out of the area for about 30 years. I came back to Peoria five years ago, and I've seen that there hasn't been as much um, advancement as there should be. I'm really running to change that, to change mindsets, and to get people to revitalize the older neighborhoods. I live in the East Bluff, and I am proud of that. Thank you very much. My name is Benjamin Arnix Jr. I have moved to Peoria three years ago because I was called to be the pastor of St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church on the south side of town. I also am the regional Northwest Region Unemployment Office Employment Services Program Manager for our area. And then another third hat that I do hold is that I work with the Peoria Community Against Violence on the board, and I assist with the crisis response team. What got me started and interested in running for city council is the fact that in my short term here in the three years, I see that there is work that needs to be done. Uh, with the crisis response team, I've met with a lot of families that have been victims of violence. As a pastor of a church, I've through the community and my congregation that I work with, I have seen a lot of issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, working at the unemployment office, I see a lot of individuals that come in and need assistance with jobs, that need help with resumes, need his assistance with reentry after coming out of prison. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And the thing that got me uh, this past year was I saw some form of the city council not functioning in the way that it should in order to make things happen for the people of this community. And one of the things, I'm not a doctor, but uh, some things that I have learned over my time and growing up is that a doctor will give you a shot, or give you a pill to help you with what you have as an ailment. That was my motivation. I need to get in and get involved to make the change that needs to happen. I can't sit around on the outside and expect somebody else to do it. So that's why I'm getting involved. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9 and 22, Paul writes, I am all things to all men so that I might save some. I want to help save some of the things that are going on in this community. There are a lot of people that want change. There are a lot of people that want to see it, and I want to make it happen for them. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, today, I would like to thank Change Peoria for organizing this event, Chama St. Louis, for uh, hosting this event at your studio, and Mr. McCall for being a moderator, and my fellow candidates. Thank you for running with me, personally. I have been passionate about serving my own community since I was a teenager. It's something that has been passed on to me from my great uncle who participated in civil rights in 1964-65 during his time in Alabama. He told us that you need, you need to serve your own community. The way is to fight for the people who can and make sure everyone is treated equally. That's something I carry on with me to this day. When I was a practicing attorney in New York, I joined, I, um, I was a pro bono attorney for New York City Civil Courts. I was a mentor for a youth, um, and tutored them in SATs and college applications. 10 years ago, I moved to Peoria. As soon as I moved here, I got involved with Priory State Legal Services. I also joined, um, joined Easter Seals because I love the program, what they're doing, and I care. I wanted to do something for this community because over the years, Peoria has become my home, and this is where I belong, and I want to give back to my community. i have on the board of um, one of my main goals at the City Hall is uh, accelerate job training, improve quality of life, and make sure, uh, create a sustained environment for our area businesses. Dear Peorians, I am here to serve you. I want to be your voice at the City Hall. My name is Anu Uddavolu. I want to be your city council at large. Okay, but sorry, false alarm. 
Okay, uh, so yeah, my name is Mike Vespa. Um, first of all, I, I would like to thank everyone else uh, here who's seated at these tables with me. Um, I, I'd like uh, to thank Mr. Chris McCall for moderating this debate, taking time out of his Saturday. Um, and I'd like to thank Change Peoria and, and Ryan, its executive director. Uh, this, this looks like a great, great turnout today and, and I hope this can be informative. And I like an engaged audience, I, I like people to you know, be engaged voters. Um, so anyway, I uh, introduce myself. My name is Mike Vespa. Like I said, I grew up in Peoria. Uh, I went to Bradley University. Uh, I went to NIU for law school. Except for those three years at NIU, I spent my entire life uh, in Peoria. Um, at NIU, uh, by the way, I'm a school shooting survivor. So 15 years ago, I was, I was on the floor of my apartment with sirens and helicopters above. Uh, it was pretty terrifying. Um, I, I certainly don't wish that anybody. Uh, my sister is a news reporter. She's with NBC Nightly News and the Today Show. She was up in um, the latest shooting. Uh, but I mean, that's that's terrible. But I, I'm, I'm getting off track here. I came back here. Um, I have, have been a Democratic uh, precinct committee man for about uh, six years. Um, and I've been a lawyer. I've been a public defender. I've been representing all sorts of folks uh, in Peoria. Um, I've been dealing with addiction, people struggling with addiction, domestic violence, um, and obviously, you know, felonies. I've done felony jury trials. I think there's a lot of dysfunction in City Hall. Um, I think that dysfunction needs somebody to come in there and get things done instead of arguing over like patents, who holds a patent. I, I don't see that as being productive. We need productive um, people on, on the City Council. I think there's a lot of good options here, but I do submit that I'm I will be uh, great for Peoria. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. It's time to get started. I was asked to instruct you all when you address the audience and those watching at home to please stand up because it is a little bit difficult to see each and every individual. I will remain seated as you all are stars of the show. I am not, all right? And so we're gonna, get directly to our first question. And because Mr. Boone, he won or he may have lost, considering he can go first. The first topic we're going to discuss is slightly out of order. It's gonna be economic justice. The question I will ask is, how do you plan to address poverty and income inequality in our great city? I love that question, <laughs> uh, so I think I am lucky. Um, I think the answer to that question will actually solve all of our issues. Um, one of the things that I'm looking at is what Evingston is doing right now, as far as some of the residents that you know are the poorest amongst them, to be able to have a stimulus to be able to help them into home ownership. You know, you can give a family maybe $500 a month for 24 months or or whatever to help stimulate home ownership help lift uh, families out of poverty. Um, just like that mother I spoke about earlier, you know, all she was looking for was not a, you know, not a handout, but just help me get up, help me get up, help me to uh, raise my children. So I think that stimulus would also help. Um, and that would help with, you know, crime because we all understand the root cause, I hope we all understand the root causes of crime is poverty. So being able to inject this stimulus being able to make sure that just like everybody else here, people in the horseshoe represent those that haven't had the power, those that haven't been in the light, um, because a lot of uh, people in Peoria, the ones in power, you know, they're in these silos or in these cliques. They're not the ones that are representing the East Bluff, the South Side. And that's why I wanted to get in the race, because we wanted to make sure that we injected uh, policies to help these type of people. So that stimulus will help. Um, and then making sure that we can try to do a business incubation center to help those young entrepreneurs that are trying to come and, and uh, have new businesses. Ms. Foreman, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. <clears throat> How do you plan to address poverty and income inequality in our city, Peoria, Illinois? Yes. 
I believe uh, the best way to help our community uh, uh, is to begin to reinvest into uh, the community. Uh, and, and as uh, uh, Mr. Boone said, you know, a lot of people don't want handouts. They want a way out. And so uh, giving them uh, an opportunity to uh, to uh, to get uh, better jobs, to uh, to be able to have good housing, uh, to be able to, uh, to have some pride uh, in uh, in uh, in our city and what they are trying to accomplish. Uh, there are a lot of organizations uh, that we have here uh, giving them those resources. Uh, to tap into, to find out uh, who's helping in whatever particular area uh, that we are in. And I believe giving them that kind of opportunity, as I said, makes them uh, feel uh, prideful about uh, themselves. And then it will also, uh, as uh, he said, it will it will cause us to uh, deal with the crime that we are uh, dealing. A lot of folks are hopeless. They are hopeless. And coming out of what we just come out of uh, when it comes to the, pa the pandemic, man, we have a lot of uh, people that just cannot see their way. I think it is incumbent upon us, especially uh, our political leaders, to lift that hope, to give the people of Peoria hope. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to do. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologize for not calling calling you pastor. So, all right, now, Mr. Bashar, I'm going to ask you the same question. Now, this first round, since these are just introductory questions, everyone will get the same question. Next round of questions, everyone will get a different question. Okay, so I'll repeat the question for you. Okay, how do you plan to address poverty and income? inequality in our city. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, one of my main uh, priorities is to revitalize our core neighborhoods, East Bluff, South Side, North Valley, Center Bluff, okay? Specifically, how you do this. We reinvest in those neighborhoods by getting working and decent and upgraded streetlights. We reinvest in our sidewalks and we make sure that we get rid of the housing blight, the things that are, you know, malignant and put all kinds of negative um, uh, mindsets and, and, and things into our, into our core neighborhoods that don't deserve the infrastructure degradation that the city has left them with over the years. One of the main things I, want to do as, as, as part of a restorative effort is to have universal basic income. Chicago is trying this now, Cook County is trying this now, and universal basic income has been um, a positive and, 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 and it works as success in America and all around the world. We have to do things like universal basic income, which is getting a certain amount of money to the people who are in the lowest economic uh, levels, we have to help them on a governmental level, and it doesn't have to necessarily be tax money, but the government has to help the people who need it most, and this is something that I am committed to. Okay, and we've heard from Director Boone, Pastor Foreman, Mr. Richard, now we hear from Pastor Nick Stream. Thank you, Attorney McCall. I believe one of the things that we should focus on is that people need to be in sustaining type jobs. Uh, one of the things I would like to focus on is assisting people find the right kind of work that's going to be a livable wage, that's going to be able to assist them in taking care of their families and then building generational wealth. Second thing that I want to focus on is the education of our children. Uh, we need to be able to bring up those children in a way so that they can be productive citizens within our society. I think that if we focus on programs for them and showing them that there are things that they are capable of doing and providing a path and a light for them in the future, they are going to be in a position where they can become 
adults that will be productive in society like everyone else and then show them that there is a path forward because I believe a lot of the young people today don't think that there's much out there for them and they don't have the positive outlook on the future that it could be and I want to change that for them. Uh, we start with them, we start with the adults that need it, the employment and that way we can build a nice solid base that we can start and bridge from that. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Attorney Uda Walu, the question is, how do you plan to address poverty and income inequality in our city? Thank you for the question, Ms. Michael. Um, one of my priorities at the City Hall is, how are we going to accelerate the job growth in our community? One, I'm going to implement and support the programs that will give training for the young youth and adults in every profession, every trade so that they are, the jobs in town are that are filled and we can also attract, bring more businesses into town so that they will employ our talent in town. We definitely want to retain, keep our talent in town so that we can get more revenue, we can generate more revenue. So my goal is to make sure that there is training available in, for every profession. That way there is an opportunity available from everyone from every neighborhood or every part of our city has a job. And we will invest in programs that will bring jobs to this town or we will attract businesses telling them that there are jobs available in town because we have an amazing talent here. And that is my one of my priorities at the city hall. Attorney Vespa, how do you plan to address poverty and income inequality in our city? Thank you, Chris. Um, right now, I, the job market is actually pretty good. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates we've had in years. Uh, it's not the same against bringing in jobs, but I think, I think we're facing more of an addiction problem right now. Something like JOLT needs better funding. Uh, code enforcement, uh, there, you know, there have been a lot of code enforcement officers that have been uh, let go, and therefore there's a lot of landlords not keeping up their properties, uh, and there's out-of-state corporations buying up our properties, not keeping them livable. Uh, that's that's certainly hurting people too. Uh, support Peoria Housing Authority. Um, I know there's new leadership there, um, but you know access to affordable housing should should be the goal uh, for the city council. And uh, you can help people, you know, expunge their criminal records. I know sometimes we have those workshops, um, but, you know, that's often a barrier for people to get ahead. Um, also, the, uh, the food desert, I think, that we have, you know, like MacArthur Highway um, uh, and John Gwynn, we were supposed to get a grocery store, but uh, that grocery store wanted to sell alcohol. I, I'm not in favor of selling alcohol, but maybe give, give that developer some uh, some incentive, like like a tip there, instead of a downtown hotel for fifty million dollars. So, thanks. Attorney Vespa, the first question is to you again. Now, I want to remind you all: this is the point. Now that we've gotten warmed up a little bit, each one of you are going to get a different question. Okay. The first question for you but we're gonna stay under the same topic areas, is crime and violence. It's perfect timing as the chief is walking in. What are some effective strategies to prevent and reduce gun violence in our city? Attorney Vespa. Thank you, Chris. Um, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I certainly, certainly think everybody wants to reduce uh, crime and violence. And actually it has been coming down. Um, I, think, I think we went from like 30 to 20, over the last year, that's good. Certainly, we need to make more progress there. Um, I like some of the ideas uh, that have been floated and are going to be implemented, like co-responding. Um, so if somebody like this, you know, if there is a call, somebody suicidal, um, you know, that happens. Uh, instead of just having uh, police show up, um, maybe also have, you know, social workers show up so, you know, that they can talk to them, talk them down. Um, I think I think that strategy, if in place, you know, might have saved um, Vincent's life. 
Um, I, I really, I really think so. Um, but it, it is coming. I fully support that. I think there's things we can do. Body cameras, great. I think even cops like body cameras because they they like the truth to come out. You know, if they're they're behaving well, you know, they want they want that to be shown just as if uh, the people that they interact with. So, anyway, those are my ideas. Thank you. Attorney Udavu. What are some of the root causes of crime and violence in our city and how would you address them? Well, as a city council members, we have to collaborate with every department in our city. One of the main ones we need to collaborate is with our police department and Peoria Health Department. I'm definitely going to rely on our health department and police department to give us a guidance a little bit so that we can collaborate and implement the programs they think are the best for our community. And I'm willing to listen to them and find what are the root causes. If they suggest something, I'm there with them. I would love to sit. And I'm definitely going to rely on them for their expertise and their guidance. Pastor Nix, how would you promote community policing, policing and trust building between the police and the residents? I believe we can promote that by assisting and partnering with the police department, with the proper individuals partnering with them. When I say proper individuals, I mean people that are known in the community, that have a good standing, but also have a good working relationship with the police department. Uh, one of the things I've seen working with PCAV, dealing with the violence in the community, a lot of young people are, are part of this. Uh, who do they look up to? Who do they see as mentors? Who do they see as leaders? What individuals can we pull that can work and partner with the police department and with them to reach these young people, to get them to want to stop doing what they're doing, to change their motivations and to move in a different direction? I think that uh, partnering with the police department can be a beautiful thing. The problem is, is having the right people in the right position to do the right thing. And we need to go through a proper process to make sure that the individuals we choose and select to do this type of work are going to be the people that can actually succeed and move forward with the program that we'd like to set forth. Mr. Bashard, how would you allocate mental health crisis intervention and response resources in our city. Thank you um, for the question. I think I would, how we distribute those resources is we look to the alt responder. Um, uh, one of the things we do is we look to the alt responder model that's supposed to be up and running right now, I believe. If uh, we had some of those things where when you have a situation where there's obviously a mental health situation going on, an episode, that you get those mental health professionals to the, si the scene of, a, of, a, of something going on, like uh, in the, 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 the Mr. Richmond uh, situation. Uh, we need a lot more mental health professionals there and a lot less police. A lot less police. And those things are they're supposed to be on the books now. Why aren't they being implemented? So I think the mindset now is let's get the right people in the right places. The police are not, not one of the priorities for me in that situation. I think we need to expand the services now. I believe it is either um, St. Francis or Methodist is building a new facility uh, focused on mental health. So we need to support that is issue and to get a lot, lot more uh, situations, facilities, in our area so that when people have breakdowns uh, with uh, opioid situ situations that we have places to send them. And right now we really don't. Pastor Underwood Foreman, what is your stance on reallocating police department funds to social services and community programs? Well, I believe, thank you. 
uh, I believe uh, that uh, redirecting uh, situations, because a lot of times the police is called uh, on a particular uh, uh, incident when actually it should be uh, EMTs or other organizations, mental health uh, uh, resources to handle that. Uh, I believe that uh, I definitely do not uh, believe in the uh, defunding, but I do think uh, taking uh, money and moving it over to those uh, different organizations to help them to be able to uh, to do whatever is needed uh, to help. Uh, I believe uh, the, pol the police department and these particular organizations working together uh, will make a difference. Uh, that there was uh, an incident, and it was uh, several years ago uh, when a young man was killed, and uh, I was actually on the scene. The parent had called me to come, and uh, there was no mental health person there. So getting uh, the right people in the right places, I believe, is going to make the difference. Director Boone, again, we are under the topic of crime and violence. How would you address concerns of police accountability and community trust in law enforcement as a city councilman? Uh, as a former Peoria police officer and now currently um, a Peoria Public Schools campus police officer, that's been my mission. Um, it's, you know, it's public knowledge about what happened with me and why I left the Peoria Police Department. And it was over a racial issue because I reported that racial issue when it wasn't a popular time to snitch on the police at that time. But I reported that issue and there was a lot of internal strife where officers didn't back me up. Officers were trying to get me to, to quit the job. Um, and I was a 21 year old kid. Um, and I'm actually proud of myself for taking that stance at that time. But um, it, it has to start systemically because I know when I was at the police academy, they did not train officers for culture. If, if I went into an Indian community or I went into an Italian community or I went into a black community, we all communicate different. And officers need to be trained to know that we all interact differently. Um, and that accountability also has to be that people, black, brown, people of color have to be in positions of power in those departments. Now we put a police chief in there in position of power who looks like us, who, who sounds like us, who, you know, mirrors us. And there have been some things that's happened on the inside and him and I speak personally. Um, he's made some decisions that aren't popular, hurt a lot of feelings. And you do that when you break things systemically. And I think when you put certain people in certain rooms and you hold people accountable, there's not going to be any of those jokes about black people or poor people or whatever, because the people in that room are going to be those sorry. people. Thank you. Okay, candidates, we have one more round, more than likely before we take a break. And so we're gonna start again with Attorney Vesper. And ladies and gentlemen, the topic of discussion will be infrastructure. Attorney Vesper, how would you address our city's traffic congestion and safety issues, especially in areas near schools, downtown, in major events? Thank you, Chris. It's uh, a good question. Um, I like roundabouts. I, I think roundabouts are, you know, work well, they, they are efficient. Uh, they don't need any electricity to run the lights. You know, it's pretty cheap to, you know, convert something in a roundabout and it lasts forever. Just gotta mow the grass. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, downtown, uh, I, I don't think we need six lanes in, in Adams and Jefferson. I think that was, you know, that was put in place uh, decades, decades ago in Peoria was expected to keep growing rapidly. Uh, that didn't materialize. We've been sort of stagnating. Um, so, I mean, people just zoom through and, and a lady actually got killed because somebody was driving recklessly. I think, I think if the streets are bare and, you know, I think that encourages more reckless driving. So anyway, I, I would I would be in favor of converting a lot of these six way one way or six lane one way streets to, to you know two lanes, kind of like we got a water street um, and more you know green space, make it nicer. It's it's better for the businesses too because people are actually seeing what they're you know driving past. 
Thank you. <laughs> Attorney Udubu, some community members say we have a traffic problem. What do you think? How would you mitigate those concerns or change the situation? Okay. Um, definitely, we need to convert our Jefferson and Adams Street from for one-way lane to two-way lane because statistics have shown that the one-way lane traffic, they actually tend to drive, drivers tend to drive faster when it's, uh, when if, if it is two-way lane, they tend to drive slower because two-way lane is actually allows for more pedestrians to be on the streets, on sidewalks then it will actually encourage more businesses to open up and people will be walking. They will be able to get into these stores and the cars will slow down. So the two-way streets actually help boost our economy also. That will actually help opening up more small businesses. People are going in there and, it is, and they are generating revenue for us. Pastor Next Jr., how do you define gentrification? And what are some signs or indicators that it is happening? Uh, I say I would define gentrification as a moving of one people to another area and then some people moving back in. Uh, we have to be careful with that uh, in honesty because we do not want to displace anyone. We don't want anyone to feel like they are being moved on purpose. Uh, one of the things I believe that we can do is make sure that we are providing housing, affordable housing, or assisting those that need assistance in getting the proper type of housing, making sure they can establish their home where they want to be and not have people feel like they have to be moved to another place. Another thing that we got to be careful of is trying to, in that thought or mind frame of attracting people to a certain area, you're attracting a certain type of person. You have to be careful of that. Uh, we are all one people. We are all one community. It doesn't matter if you're black, brown, white, Asian. It does not matter. You're not catering to one type of person. You're catering to the city as a whole. So we need to make sure that we're providing the means for everybody, no matter what walk of life you come from, to be able to live where you want to live and be able to have the money to to live the way you want to live. Mr. Bashar, what are some of the specific tools or resources that you will provide to new entrepreneurs through a business incubation center? Thank you, Chris. I think one of the things we have to do, of course, to try to bring in outside businesses, but the most important thing we need to do is to go to our businesses that are right here, right now, and help them, okay? If I get on the city council, I'm going to the little restaurant in my neighborhood. I'm going to the little convenience store in my neighborhood. And I'm saying, how can we help you grow your business? Because the food deserts that were mentioned, you know, that's a huge issue here. What we need to do is to go to our people right now that are providing these services and, and get them to expand, to build more of these types of businesses in more of the challenged neighborhoods and to help them grow their businesses. So I don't know the ins and the outs of the incubation program per se, but I know that we have to help the people who have invested already in our neighborhoods and help them do the job that they are bound to do because they know the city, they know the people, and they know their customers. And so I think we need to go a lot more to our existing businesses like the one right here, like Euphoria, and say, how can the city help them complete their mission? And that's what I do. Pastor Underwood Foreman. How would you balance the need for rehabbing existing homes and storefronts with the demand for new development in our city? Well, I think it would be. All right. I think uh, it would be more uh, advantageous 
to uh, rehab the existing homes that we have, put some money into those homes. Because uh, most of the time when you've got new developments, uh, people cannot afford them. And the reason being is because of the taxes, uh, high taxes that comes along with it. We need to work with what we have. We need to go into the communities and talk to these uh, homeowners and find out uh, what uh, needs to be done to help them to get their home. A lot of people have been in these homes for years and don't want to leave their home. They just want help in getting their homes fixed up. So that's one of the things I will do is go into the community, talk to these people that are living uh, in these homes that need help and offer help for them. Director Boone, what are some benefits and challenges of allowing accessory commercial units in residential areas? Um, a lot of benefits as far as revenue and you know generating revenue, but I worry about trying to do too much in specific areas. And there's actually one thing that we're talking about now, putting a retirement home or retirement village in the South and the Peoria. Um, when we start looking at the South and the Peoria, we need to look at what really needs to be there. Yeah. Um, if you're going to put it in 61605, it better fly in 61652. If 61615 can say no, then 61605 should be able to say no and still have the same power to do it. Um, and you talked about gentrification. That's another piece of it, too. You know, when a place like Darwin Homes can buy up homes from people, and fix them up. And I've been on that website to look at how much you're gonna charge for rent to make sure that um, that's gonna be accurate. But then some of those people that those homes are bought away from can't even buy back into the own neighborhoods that they grew up in. So you wanna make sure that if you're gonna use commercial and residential and, and, and play that game, make sure that we invest in the people first and make sure that we're, we're on top of, you know, who's buying up these homes. Um, they did a national, a national magazine did a story on Lincoln Avenue that people were buying up houses sight unseen from Colorado, California, Texas, and they just left these houses. Um, and it just really drives down value. But then somebody else will pick them up like Darwin Homes, fix them up real nice. And then the own people can't even move back in there. So uh, those are the main things that I want to focus on on city council is making sure we invest in people. Hey, everyone. What's the first half great? All right, we're gonna take a time out now. We're gonna give everyone 10 or 15 minutes so they can relax, get a drink of water. And I wanna thank you all. Five minute break? All right, all right, all right. well, if the building owner told me we gotta be five minutes, it gotta be five minutes, okay? Um, again, I wanna remind you all, it is very difficult for these individuals to get up here and do this. It is tough. They have used their own resources, there have been sacrifices on their friends and their families to run for office to benefit you all, okay? This is your last chance to get questions in, take a bathroom break, and we'll see you in five minutes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back here from break. Now, the first half of the debate, it was good. At least I think it was good. Y'all think it was good? Yeah. Okay. One criticism, it really wasn't much of a debate, okay? So we're gonna ask questions now and we're going to address them to the group. And not only can the individuals respond, but then they can address their opponent, okay? And then once you address your opponent, your opponent has 60 seconds to respond and then using Samuel L. Jackson phrase from, from Pulp Fiction, may I retort? You then have 30 seconds to retort, okay? So me, excuse me, my English teacher would have hated that. Sincere and I will remind you of the times when we do this, okay? So let's have a debate. And so at this point, we're no longer holding hands and walking in line. It's gonna get a little bit more aggressive now, okay? All right, and I have the questions here, and I've had multiple individuals who've stopped me 
and want to voice her displeasure about people not being here, I've said it, and I'll move on from it, okay? Okay, the building owner says every candidate was invited. Okay, if they're not here, it's because they declined or could not make it. The first question, and I'm gonna address this to all of you. Let's have a discussion, okay? Many police reform activities, excuse me, strike that. That's a lawyer courtroom word, so that means forget you heard it. Many police reform activists have been calling for community control of police. Would you support this piece of legislation? Who wants to go first? Mr. Richard. That's uh, community control of police, right? Yes. All right. Yeah, I'll take that question because I am a defund the police candidate. Okay. I'm proud of that. That doesn't mean abolish the police. It means take money out of their budget and put it into community groups like Jolt, like the Girls and Boys Club, like a million other groups that we have here. Okay, there's only a limited amount of money. The police have too much of it. They have not shown that they can use it wisely. Look at Mr. Richmond. Okay, and, and a part of that, what you have to do is you have to require the police, the firemen, and all of the city employees, all the new employees to be from Peoria. <laughs> mandatory, mandatory. Because when you have police who live next to me in the East Bluff, or live next to you in the South Side, or live next to you in the North Valley, they're going to be thinking a lot more about how to help you than how to go to the gun or, or go to violence or anything like that. And this is the mindset that we need changed in Peoria and a lot of other places. So now, that's Sharp, where I'm coming from. Let me jump in. Is there anyone whose position that is running for office that you believe it's different than your position on the fund. I, I'm not here to go at anyone here. So I'm just going to say that anyone who thinks that we need to involve the police more so than what we're doing, I, I, I don't believe in that because we're elected to make policy. The police are not there to make policy or anything like that. They hire us. They hire elected people to, or they elect people for us to set the policies. And that's what, I intend to do, if I make it, is to set humane policies and, and go from there. I am not afraid of anything. All right, Pastor Nix Jr. I appreciate your position. Uh, one of the things I want to be careful about in what he was speaking about is that defunding, uh, what percentage are we discussing in reallocation? If the police department is not fully staffed currently, what do we got to do to provide incentives to get the people here that we need to have here? You talk about you want to have certain individuals within the community, which is nice, which is a good thing. But what's the incentive for them? Uh, what is going to be the driving factor to have people live in the community that going to police the community? Uh, if we have to pay to have somebody relocated to come here, uh, if that means bringing people from outside the city in. Uh, where are we going to get the money from that? If you're taking money away from the police department to put it in other places, that's going to put them in a position where they're not able to do those type of things. So we have to be careful with the amount of reallocation. Yes, we can put money towards social services. Yes, we can do those things and they should be done. But we have to be careful because if you rob Peter to pay Paul, somebody's going to fall short in the middle. So, yes, we can do those things. We have to be careful with what we're, how we're going to do it, how we implement it. But we have to make sure that the police department is funded for staffing the way they need to be staffed and then uh, increase in the staffing where they need to have the social service staffing implemented within them. Now, Mr. Mishara, I saw you shaking your head and it looks like you want to retort. Yes. 30 seconds. Yes. We make those decisions. OK, not the police. 
Okay, they're tools and we are there to set policy. So I say this, I want the police defunded by 25, ideally by 25%, okay? And I think we need to start on that right now and get the money into the groups that need it, okay? Look, you know, you, you were saying like some people are, are gonna be left behind robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're already left behind. The city is left behind. The working people are left behind. And we have cops making sixty and seventy thousand dollars who are cruising through our neighborhoods who don't deserve to be there. Director Boomer, sixty seconds. Uh, I respect both of your opinions. <laughs> it's very drastic. As an officer that was an that has been an officer in uniform with Peoria Police Department and currently an officer for the school district. Um, I understand well, how you feel your way, why you feel the way about police you feel, because as a black man, I've been a black man for 41 years now, even in uniform, when an officer is driving behind my vehicle, I still have fear and I'm an officer. So I understand that one of the things we have to do is make sure that the community does have more control of the police and we need to have citizen review boards. Anytime there's an, an officer shooting, the citizens need to be involved in that review board also. Peoria Police, when I applied, we had over 250 officers. Right now they have 196, maybe, ish. If you guys understood how big, how geographically big one officer has to cover things, that's already an issue. There have been times when I logged on duty as a Peoria Police officer, there's eight calls holding. I drive to a house, it's a domestic and you've waited 30 minutes to That's get there where somebody could have been hurt. So we gotta be very careful about just saying defund. We need to give citizen accountability over right, the police. Cut you off here, gotta but cut you off. not just defund. Attorney Udabulu, what is your state? I think we need to collaborate with every department. Before we start attacking everybody, I think we are here at the city, not just a city council, as a community, we have to collaborate with every department. We need to have an open conversation with, within our community. Even our police chief or police officers, we need to have a conversation with all of them and to figure out what do we need. If they are short on staff, this is where we need to try to create, give them that, are they, did they open up jobs? Can they hire somebody in our own city? Like Mr. Demaria Boone said, if somebody, an office or somebody who looks like them, talks like them, they will trust them. Well, this is where we'll open up the training and help them create this training so that they are hiring somebody within our own community. Because we wanna make sure that the people here, the officers are understanding because they are from our own community. So let's give them the respect they deserve because we all deserve it and we have to respect every profession and every sacrifice they're making because as a city council member, I would never want to outweigh our public safety over something else. I always want to make sure our public safety is priority and your interests are also priority. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt, you know? Okay, is there anyone else who has not spoken and wants to address this issue? Attorney, okay. Well, we'll go ladies first and then we got your council, okay? Thank you for that. Um, uh, there is a lot uh, that I disagree with here. Uh, there is good and bad in everything. You got good cops, bad cops. You got good and, and bad in everything. I do not <clears throat> believe that um, the community should control the police. That's just like having another. I don't know how many of you have watched the movie Purge of letting people just do whatever they want to do or whatever for one day. I think that we need to uh, come together and sit down and see what it is uh, that we need to do. And sometimes the wording that we use, we use defund. Defund uh, to some degree has a negative connotation because uh, defunding def definitely does not mean, you know, taking everything from the police. So we need to be more specific in what we mean when we say defund. Now, I do not believe in uh, the community controlling uh, uh, the police, just like my child is not going to come to me and say, uh, Mama, I want to be in control of everything. No, there is a place and a position that my child has 
or whatever. I'm going to hear from them. But other than that, I'm the one that's in control here. And we need to let everybody do their thing and do whatever they have been paid to do. <clears throat> OK, Attorney Vesper, 60 seconds. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I mean, as I mentioned before, I think co-responding is a good idea when, when there's a call, somebody with an obvious mental health issue, we, we should have a social worker, somebody who can go there to help deal with that, talk them down. Um, but I, I don't think just sending the social worker is a good idea either. If, if this person's armed and is dealing with mental health issues, we, we do need, we do need police. Uh, they are understaffed. I don't want to cut their budget. I, I don't want to necessarily increase their budget. I don't, I don't like, you know, military policing, um, but they are necessary. There are some bad dudes out there. Um, unfortunately, you do need you do need cops. You need good cops, though. And often those cops have their own mental health issues that they're dealing with. So, I mean, I, I think I think we need to make sure that cops can can find those uh, counselors or what have you to help process. A lot of times they have their own home lives that that are upended um, that they're dealing with and they need help, too. Um, so that's where I stand on that. Thank you. Okay. Next topic. And this is addressed to each and every one. And if you want to address a specific person, you can, as a reminder. Again, I'll remind you all, you all are looking for votes among the same group of people. Okay. So check for nuances here. What will you do to help with the missing persons? In other words, the Alexis, the Alexis Scott campaign. Who wants to go first? Mr. Bouchard. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been working on the Alexis Camry Scott uh, campaign ever since I returned to Peoria about just shy of five years ago. Um, I don't think the police have done near as much for for the people who are missing, who are people who are people of color, the people who are women. I mean, if you look at the uh, at what's happened in Peoria over the last few, over the last years and decades, those people have always been at the bottom of the pile as far as you know putting their priorities go. I would, I'm just, I just want to say that in five years, if they haven't got a good lead. Why are these people still employed? Why are these investigators still around? They haven't done their job. Okay, so I don't know whatever they're doing now. It's not good enough. And if I get in there, things are going to change. Mr. Boone, go ahead. Director Boone. Yeah, I uh, worked down at Manuel High School with uh, Alexis's mother and see the mental strife that she went through um, trying to look for her daughter. <clears throat> and then I also worked alongside with several pure police officers uh, trying to help j just generate anything to to get to figure out what happened. And we already know systemically black and brown children who end up missing. Um, the cities don't put resources behind them because the people in power don't look like those children. A, a white child ends up missing. They will name something after them, an Amber Alert. Um, you ain't going five minutes without seeing a picture or a sign. So one of the things we can do as city council members is put the heat on people to keep stuff out in, in public view. Um, we can spend money on hotels and stuff like that. How come we can't put Alexis Scott signs up? How come we can't talk about it every meeting that we have, every time we go to talk to homeowners? Why don't we have signs out there? Peoria spends money on the things that they feel is important. Um, I feel Alexis is important. Um, Lawrence has been championing this as well. You know, they've been in the forefront of it. Um, but as city council members, that's the reason we kind of want to be in these positions is to be able to tout the things that we feel are important to us, to people that look like us too. Um, so I think one of the main things we need to do is spend money on uh, uh, more on the social media campaign, put the signs out, get people out in the street to knock doors that just not all the time have to be in uniform because some people trust people more that are not in uniform too. But we can spend the money on that to bring this to the forefront. Okay. Does anyone else want to address this question? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next topic. 
I just want to say one thing about spending the money. You got 30 seconds. The, the, okay, we've only got $2,500, a measly little amount of money on the Lexus Camry Scott. Okay, position for, um, you know, for crime stoppers. It should immediately be boosted to $5,000 and $10,000, and the city show that they are serious. Right now, they are not serious on the Alexis Camry Scott campaign. I'll say it to the police chief. I'll say it to any cop in the room, and I'll say it to anyone in City Hall. Next topic, then, unions. What is your position on unions? Will you support collective bargaining for all City of Peoria unions? Pastor News. I do support unions. I believe unions do have a place in ensuring that people get what they need from businesses and employers. Uh, you can look throughout history and see why unions were created. And you can see that people needed to have certain rights, responsibilities, and certain benefits applied to them through the jobs that they had. And the employers took advantage of people and didn't matter by age, race, or sex. They took advantage of their employees. So we should support the union in the best way possible, making sure that they get a fair, decent bargain in their bargaining agreement. Uh, we should make sure that through that process that we listen to them, what the needs are. If there's somewhere that we've fallen short in the past, that we make sure we take care of those shortcomings and prepare them to have the right kind of employment that they need, the right kind of benefits that they need so that they can have a sustainable life in their future through the employment that they have through the city. Is there anyone who wants, Mr. Attorney Vespa. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, um, my grandfather was a union welder with an eighth grade education at Caterpillar. Um, it's, it's because of that opportunity that my family uh, succeeded and I, I was given the advantages that I have today, able to go to college um, and become a lawyer. So I, I, feel, I feel that, you know, that is something that is truly American, and um, everybody in Peoria. I want I want everybody to have the same opportunity that I have because unions. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I do support collective bargaining. I, I think we need to to support unions. Um, it really helps people get a leg up. Thank you. Um, you know, being a lawyer, I'll say one thing: when a one person files a lawsuit versus a class action bunch of people. It's the same as with the union. Union is where leaders are speaking on behalf of the entire group. They are making sure everybody in the group is taken care of, their voice is heard. So they wanna make sure that everybody has a job, they are getting their benefits and everything and they're bargaining on their behalf. They are basically being their voice. Just like us being at the city council, we wanna be your voice, how we are trying to be your voice they are the members' voice. Anyone else want to address you? I do support uh, unions. I think uh, unions are a great, great part of our, uh, of our country. Uh, I believe people get up and they go to work, they work hard for their money. And they want someone that is fighting for them to make sure that uh, their well-being uh, has a uh, priority. Because if we did not have unions, it would give uh, all of the uh, companies and corporations uh, just uh, the uh, thing to just do whatever they wanted to do. So we need the union uh, need folk fighting for them to make sure that they get whatever it is that they need, that they work so hard for. Right. Now what we're going to do, so we can get through some of the questions, I'm going to address um, tables at a time. So I will consider um, Director Boone, um, of course, Pastor Underwood Foreman and Mr. Machard one table, and then I'll consider everyone to the right of me one table since we are evenly balanced, okay? So I'll start with, actually we'll go to table two, okay? And we'll start with... Uh, with, uh, let's go with Pastor Nick's Jr. What is your plan for the food desert in 61605? I received about 10 different questions about 61605 in the food desert. Uh, currently, uh, there is in the works by Pastor Chuck uh, Brown 
uh, trying to do something over there. Uh, I applaud him in his work in trying to do something. Uh, the thing is, is we have to be mindful of how we move forward. If what he is doing does not work, if it does not come to fruition, what we need to do is figure out a way that we can find someone or some business that will come in and take the place of what he is trying to do. Uh, I have not lived here very long. I've already stated that three years. Whatever was there before, whatever uh, grocery store was uh, at that facility, uh, they moved out for whatever reason, whatever purpose. We need to look at another, if it's a regular grocery chain or uh, look at Hy-Vee, Kroger, whoever, and say, can you put some smaller type facility there? How can we help you get that started, get it implemented and get it going? How, what do you need? Do you need extra security? What, what, was, what was the purpose? Did you have a lot of robberies? Did you have stealing? What was the thing that was going on that caused the other person to move out? We need to find a way to curtail that and fix that for the next person that's going to inhabit that facility to make sure that they stay, that they can earn money because that's what they're there for, and then still be able to provide the services that we need in that area. Who does it? I'm a big fan of community gardens. I think this is where, as a community neighborhoods, this will help them also mingle together. This is a moment where families are coming together, especially the kids, introducing them to gardening. Maybe let these kids, you know, start digging and growing their own plants, you know, like tomatoes or something. They actually understand the value of the food. They will learn it. The ones they grow, they want to eat it. And we are actually getting the neighborhoods together, neighbors collaborating with each other and growing these gardens together. And you know, this is what happened in Detroit. Detroit used to have a food desert. Then somebody, a little girl, a teenager, she started community gardens and it got expanded in the neighborhood. I think that is a, one of the best ways we can start. And this is where neighbors and everybody is collaborating. And as a city council member, we will encourage that. And this is where we can attract more food when there are farmers, everybody, they can come, collaborate with you, give you some guidance. You know, so you are growing your own food and it is best experience. You should try it. Attorney Vespa, Food Desert, 61605. Thank you, Chris. Um, actually, uh, there is a nonprofit uh, market, Peoria Grown. I have, I have their pamphlet with me that's, that's open on the south side um, in 61605. Uh, but, you know, it, which is fantastic. I think I think we should support them. Um, but also, like I said uh, earlier, I think uh, getting a full-fledged grocery store would be good too. And I would support some sort of incentive for a developer uh, to come, you know, at, at the uh, uh, MacArthur Highway and John Gwynn intersection. Um, that development fell through. Uh, I think we should be more open to developer, you know, sweetening the pot for developers on the south side, kind of like we do up north or downtown or for Portillo's, for example. So thank you. Let's shift the topic to water. And when I address you, if you want to use some of your remaining time to address something you've heard, feel free to do that. You have 90 seconds. So the question is, and a rem reminder, I know some of you want to address some of the things you've heard, but remember we're trying to get through some of the questions, but if you want to use some of your remaining time to address something you heard, if you disagree, please use your time to do so. Because again, we're trying to show everyone who's watching here in person and on the stream the differences between you all. What due diligence should be used to determine whether or not the city should buy the water system? Mr. Mashar. Thank you. Um, the due diligence is I, there's some kind of economic council that has studied this for years, decades, and they have a plan. So we need to look at that plan. Number one, I am for municipalizing the water system and I'd go a lot. I would go to the power system and our other basic things as well, because the people who run it, these things are their, their best interests are not for the people. The Illinois American Water, I've heard, takes out $20 million a year from Peoria. 
Do you think we could use a little bit of that money here? Okay. I am for public ownership of basic utilities, like the water, like the electricity. No Ameren shutoffs, no Ameren shutoffs, no Ameren shutoffs. Ameren is a horrible corporation that we should look to get another corporation because those people have nothing to do with humanity and decency. And they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, hide behind the fact that they're getting these different arts organizations and stuff and they're sponsoring them. The heck with that. We need to see clear through places like Ameren and Illinois American Water are not our friends. We need to take it back from them. We can control this. The people who are already working, we want to have them working for the city, right, yes. not for those off. groups. Got to cut you off. Pass around the reform. What due diligence should be done to determine how the city goes about buying a water system? Well, I think that first of all, um, a feasibility study would be good uh, to, to find out just uh, you know how it would benefit us. I uh, agree, I do believe that uh, the city should buy the, one, the water company because number one, it gives, uh, it gives control, it gives the city control. And the other thing, it, it will bring in revenue and then we can hold the water uh, the city uh, accountable for transparency. I think there's a that's a lot of the problem that we are dealing with here with different projects is that uh, the city, the people are not included into decisions that's being made. And so I want to switch over. I want to switch over with some of my time to go back if I can about that food desert that is about to drive me nuts because I cannot understand why there is no food, no uh, grocery store in the, on the South End and the East End. If this was a situation over in the fourth district or fifth district, that would not be happening. We have somebody that is willing to put their money that is working hard, Chuck Brown. We need to assist him and help him to bring grocery stores into the South End and also the East End. Director Boone. Absolutely, we should buy a water company. Um, I'm kind of tired of sending money to, I think it's New Jersey that owns it. I'm tired of sending money to Jersey. Um, and then we also, but before we buy that water company, company, we need to look at the infrastructure and see how much we're going to have to improve it. Best part about it is we use our people to improve that infrastructure. We use people that are from Peoria. We pay them and we make sure that the people that are improving that infrastructure are diverse. We make sure that black and brown people are represented in fixing that infrastructure. Uh, also, I was writing down, uh, I want to call him Pastor Lawrence when he was speaking. Um, but, you know, it, it, the, the city council has to be strategic on making sure that uh, we just, I don't want to make it, dumb it down or anything like that, but we just have to be strategic when we talk about that, that food desert. Um, so I think we all kind of agree with the water company. We want to purchase it. Um, we all are not happy with Ameren and we think that uh, we need to, to control our electricity. That way, you know, people in, in, in low impoverished areas, we're not just shutting them off. We could actually work with those families, just like Evingston. Um, that uh, stimulus could actually help that piece. So you're not just cutting those people off. You're actually injecting services in those homes and helping them to get a leg up. Um, but also when we talk about, uh, I'm sure I'm getting scatterbrained here. I'm sorry. There's just so much in the time is throwing me off. But uh, yeah, I do believe we need to buy that water company. I do believe that Peoria needs to control its own resources. That's your time. Thank you. Okay. Now for the second table, that's really the second and third table. We started the first time with uh, Pastor Nix. We're gonna start with Attorney Vespa. What is an important lesson that you've learned in the last year that has shaped your vision for Peoria? Well, last year, I mean, Certainly something very recent uh, was, I think, the, the hotel developer getting $60 million, I think, to, you know, to build another hotel downtown. I'm not sure if we have the occupancy for that. I was, I was surprised how quickly that, that was pushed through. Um, I was surprised by the dysfunction of the city council when they were debating 
um, whether to, you know, uh, I think pay $25,000 for an $8 million grant uh, in order to find uh, anti-violence initiatives, try, try to solve our violence problem. Uh, it became a lot of infighting. It became a lot of dysfunction. And that was, that was disappointing to me. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I want to get in there. I, I want to fix that. I want to be more deliberative. I want to look for solutions uh, and, and try to find the solutions with, you know, hopefully a few of these other fine folks that are, that are sitting here with me today. Thank you. I think we need to have a more transparency between the city hall and people in town. This is where we need to create more communication where city council members are often in the community, maybe every month, <laughs> holding a town hall sessions and informing all of you what is really happening at the city hall. Like having a dialogue with you and explaining what is actually happening there. And this is the one of the reasons that I decided to run because I want to be out there. I want to bring these issues back to the community and I will be the person be there every month holding a town hall or meeting you at a different locations so that I'm meeting every neighborhood and I'm presenting, telling, informing you what is happening at the city hall and why you should also participate and provide your opinion because we are there to be your voice. And that's what we want to take it back to the city hall. And until everyone participates, they won't know what is happening there. We need at least 99% of your voice needs to be heard there. So maybe when I release a survey, when I say this is something, and I would love for all of you to go there, participate, or express your opinion, send me a feedback saying that we want this decision. We want the city hall is addressing this issue. This is how we feel. And I want to be your voice there. Pastor Nix. Pastor, you ready? We're ready. All right. Uh, what I want to say is that last year I had the opportunity to address the horseshoe personally. Uh, as uh, Attorney Vespa mentioned about the cure of violence issue, I addressed city council to their face and I expressed this, that they either had some indifference or ignorance going on. And I felt that they were operating in a dysfunctional manner. The thing I want to bring to the table to city council is this, communication, collaboration. Uh, I believe that with the right individuals, and, and I believe all of us up here have this mindset, that we want to be able to talk, to have communication, to get the issues addressed, to make sure things are being taken care of. I think that we have to stand for all of you. Uh, we're representing you. So we have to be able to be reasonable, approachable, and be able to have the discussions that need to be made. Uh, if I come off combative, nobody's going to want to talk to me. No, I want to come to city council. I want somebody to be able to look at me and say, there's Nick's. I can go talk to him about this issue. Even if we're on different sides of the aisle, we can still have a conversation because we have to find somewhere where we can meet and come together to make things happen for the city of Peoria. Director Boom, we're going to transition to working together. How do you plan to engage other city council members to support your goals and plans? And I think that goes right along with, you know, being engageable, being, you know, personable. Um, but one thing I, I say when I get these, you know, questionnaires and I'm speaking to the other PACs, um, if it's not benefiting all people, because we're running for city council at large, if it's not benefiting all people, if it's just benefiting 61615 and not 61605 or, you know, 61615 most and not 05. I'm not going to be silent about it. Um, it's just certain things that you have to take a stand for. Um, just like I explained earlier with what happened to me with uh, the Peoria Police Department. I could have kept my mouth shut, but there are some times that you need to step up and say something. And there are some times you need to be you can disagree and be cordial, but then there's times where you have to step up and step out and by any means necessary, get your point across. So I think with city, other city council members, um, if I get on that council, 
I want them to be on notice that yes, I, re I respect you. I will be respectful. But if it's not for this whole count, if it's not for this whole city, we gonna have a problem. Pastor Underwood, for me. The question was, how do you plan to engage other city council members who support your goals and plans? One thing uh, I can say that I'm not going in, uh, in City Hall to reinvent the wheel. I'm going in to work with the mayor and the other council persons. Anybody knows me knows that I have my own voice. I've talked to some uh, city council persons. They've talked to me, uh, kind of seeing where I'm going to be and if I'm going to vote with them. Uh, if, if I feel that, that it's the right thing for the people, I will. And if I don't, I won't. I am the person that, that will go in there and, and, and let the people know that it is time for change. And that change is making uh, the people first priority. And that's it. Mr. Sure. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. I think I've proved since the time I've been back in Peoria, I've proved I can work with anyone. I've proved that I worked with the city council to address the mass evictions by Darwin because of the things that I did and my allies did, regular people, we stood up and we engaged our council members and we got some life-saving time for people to adjust their lives to these rapacious and horrible corporations destroying our neighborhoods. I have proven that I've already been able to deal with city council members um, on a variety of issues for several years. Okay, I'm confrontational when it needs to be because no one is standing up. And I'm sorry, I am not a go along, get along guy. I am here to make change. People's feelings are going to be hurt. And you know what? If it's some of the people who this should have happened to them a long time ago, so be it. You know, I just look at things from a human point of view. Where is the humanity? Where are the people standing up for people like Alexis Camry Scott, who has no one in her corner? She's abandoned. I will not let that happen. Okay, we're a few minutes and wrapping up, so we're going to try to move a little quicker. Okay? Uh, we started last time with Attorney Vespa, so we'll go back to Pastor Nix Jr. We are only as strong as our weakest link. What would you say is the weakest link in Peoria, and what are your plans to address it? Wow. Um, Speaking of correct. <laughs> let me focus on this. Uh, when I first moved to Peoria three years ago, my very first job was a teacher at Peoria High School. Uh, as a first year teacher, my degrees are business, in, uh, bachelor's in business administration and master's in public administration, which is perfectly geared towards city council. Uh, I had a special certificate to teach and teach business class. I was only able to teach for one year because another teacher decided that what I had established was nice and they came in and took my class and I was out of a job. Uh, I believe education is one of the weakest links that we have in this city and that needs to be fixed. Uh, I did not appreciate or like some of the policies that were put in place with the children, how we're moving them along, how we're not holding them accountable. And some people might not like when I say this, but we need to start working with the parents and hold them accountable too to make sure that they are working with their children so that we can build up the next generation. We can't just pass along people that are not ready to take over. We need to prepare them and build them up and prepare them for the future that they are going to be in control of. I definitely agree with the pastor. Um, we do need to focus on our children's education. Education is a priority. It's necessity important for everybody and we do need to incorporate more programs this is where maybe we will city council need to collaborate with the school districts to see whatever programs that need to be implemented are there next 
I think Peoria, we need to integrate and collaborate with each other. We shouldn't be divided because united, we can make things happen. And at the city hall, this is where I plan to be collaborative. I want to work with everybody. We're adults. Yes, we are bound to have different opinions, different, uh, fine. But at the end of the day, we are there to serve you. And this is where we have to put aside whatever personal opinions or agendas that we have. And we have to work together to make sure we are serving Peoria, what is best for Peoria. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think one of the weakest links right now is the dysfunction that I've been talking about earlier. It's preventing us from moving forward. Also the disparate treatment uh, between north of Route 150, War Memorial and south. I think, I think there needs to be uh, the same or more equitable investment uh, north as or south as there is north. Um, social services, I, I think, can be beefed up uh, substantially. Uh, a lot of the social workers I know are very underpaid. Um, so, I mean, I, those are the three that I saw so on. Thank you. Okay. In consideration of time, I'm going to ask one more question, and it's going to be kind of a fun question. So, Everyone can relax a little bit. Um, the question is, what animal symbolizes you as a city council person? And how will you support the arts? I'm gonna ask that question of everyone. 60 seconds, Director Boone. It was red, I didn't know if it was on. What animal would represent me? As a city council person. As a city council person. Um, it's definitely not going to be a dove because I don't say scar from <laughs> It's not going to be a dove because I'm I'm going to be very very blunt and honest. Uh, I would say a lion. I think uh, that's what we need in city council. We need somebody that's going to come in um, and demand that uh, the public is heard. So I think a lion would be uh, what I would uh, embody with city council. And how would I support the arts? Correct. Uh, I think the arts is extremely important um, working for Peoria Public Schools. I see how what happens um, when students pick up the arts and, and what they can do um, in the future with that. So, again, it's just like if Peoria can, you know, buy hotels and put money in certain areas, you know, we can get involved with helping with the arts. And I know at one point city council uh, had meetings with school board. Okay. And I think Thank that needs to go. So, Pastor Underwood Foreman. How well, would, when, what's your animal and how would you support the arts? My animal is an eagle because I believe in soaring high. I believe in going high, looking back down at the situation, evaluating the situation and scooping in and taking control of the situation. When it comes to the arts, uh, I believe that is an, uh, an, uh, it's an amazing thing when we have the arts, especially in our schools. It helps the, the children to identify who they are and some of the things that they want to do uh, uh, in their lives. So I agree with it. I wholeheartedly, I'm glad that we had it when I was in school, uh, not like we have it now, but to, to be able to, to reach down and, and figure out what I want to do and the school and the arts helped me to do that. I think that is amazing. Ms. Bashar, how would you support the arts and what animal finds you as a prospective city council person? Well, art saves lives. Art saves lives, absolutely. And everyone here knows it. I would defer to people much smarter than me about this, I would uh, maybe convene uh, the, uh, the the school uh, teachers involved with that on a secondary and grade school level. Also, take advantage of the art uh, professionals from the local universities. Convene a, a commission and go about it. How to uh, how to to implement and support the arts much more in our lives than we already are. We need to support them in our education. Absolutely. As far as an animal, I'm going to say I would like to be a cat because a cat is smart. A cat is loyal to its family. My family here and in Peoria, all through Peoria, 
And if you throw us out a window, we'll land on our feet. Pastor Nix. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Supporting of the arts is very important. Uh, studies have shown that children that are uh, given, uh, delved into the arts at an early age, uh, that get implemented into these types of programs, they develop better. Uh, and, and that studies do show that. So we do want to uh, try to show them the arts at an early age and get them started so that they can grow into that. Uh, as far as an animal, you guys are taking all these animals. Uh, but I would like to be a hawk. And the reason why I say that is because hawks have vision and they are strategic in planning and what they do and how they strike and implement what they do. I want to be strategic in how I implement the plans that I'm going to do for you, the citizens of Peoria, while I'm at city council. I would say I would like to be lab doodle, because if I don't say that, my dog would get upset with me. <laughs> Yeah. Um, just like her, I am friendly, approachable, and I'm open. I like people. I want to listen to people, and I care about people, especially I care about this community. When it comes to art, I'm a big fan of art, and I think we have to enhance more art culture in this community. The quote is, vibrant art culture leads to creativity, creativity leads to innovation, and innovation leads to opportunities. Attorney Vespa, the arts and what animal defines you as a prospective city council person? All right. Yeah, I think all the good animals are about taken now. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I guess uh, dogs, cats, uh, I, you know, beaver maybe. I mean, like, you know, I, I like building things. I think they're friendly generally as long as you don't knock down their whatever they're building in the river, you know, their, their dams. Um, so I, but yeah, I mean, I, I do want to get to work. I want to work with people on the city council. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, I love the arts. I think we have a great art community, you know, first Fridays and such. We have a vibrant art community. I think, you know, being an, an inclusive and welcoming city, I think is, is a good way to attract artists um, and, and increase uh, our community you know, maybe holding festivals, you know, maybe, maybe a film festival. I don't know. I, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different ideas, you know, you can do to, to attract people. There's plenty of towns smaller than us that have come up with something like that. Um, so, so I mean, yeah, those, those are the things I come up with. Now, Attorney Best, we're going to allow you to get a drink of water and then you'll go into your 60 second closing. Uh, so if you need to take a sip, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Is this still on? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, this this has been fun. I, I I've enjoyed the crowd. It's it's been lively, but you know, respectful, cordial. Uh, I think there there have been a lot of ideas. You know, I've learned some things tonight, and I hope I hope everybody watching at home, including everybody here, has learned some things. Um, good ideas moving forward. Um, you know, th there's going to be other forums too. We're looking forward to those. I hope the, the attendance of these future forums are going to be as, as good as we, as we have here. I, I certainly have my platform. I, I have my ideas. I've introduced myself. Um, feel free to reach out though to me. Um, and if you have questions, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to be open and approachable. Uh, even after the election, if, if I were to win, I'd be on the council. I, you know, I give my office number and, and give my email, but um, yeah, no, I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, today and I want to thank, you know, uh, Chris for moderating this and uh, Change Peoria and Ryan um, for helping put this on. Very professional and, and a good time. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Change Peoria. Thank you, Chama St. Louis, for organizing this. And I would like to thank all my co candidates for being here, fellow candidates. Um, at the city council, my priorities are one, how I want to enhance the quality of life in Peoria. This is where I want to help make the, our city safe, enhance the programs, vibrant art culture, entertainment, everything to our city. Next, I want to accelerate the job growth in the city. This is where I want to introduce the programs for training. Third, what is the mentorships, create mentorships for our youth 
it tells women, everybody, and also business owners. I'm a big supporter of our small businesses because they are the heart of our economy. I want to create a sustainable environment for them so they are here for a longer term. Finally, I want to be your voice because it's time that somebody represent you. So vote for Anu, who is voice of Peoria. Uh, once again, thank you to Attorney McCall, to Ms. St. Louis for the facility, Mr. Williams for our timekeeper and Change Peoria. Uh, I want to say this. I came here for a purpose. Uh, I'm here to be the person that is going to symbolize and represent all of Peoria. Uh, I want us to be able to find ways and paths to move forward, uh, making the conversations happen, uh, making the city council work together to make sure that we're providing and doing the job that we need to do for every citizen of Peoria, not just for the North, but for the South, East, West, everybody included, because we all have to work together to make this thing happen. And I'm going to start the conversations and make sure that the meetings are happening, that the people are listening and that the people are going to do what they say they're going to do to make sure we're getting the job done for us all. Thank you very much for everyone being here, especially the people who took time out of their day to be here. It's very important and I thank you very much and the people uh, looking at the live stream and people who will see this afterwards. Thank you very much for being engaged because that's what all this is about is civic responsibility, civic engagement. It's about being an American and that's about participating. I want to say I'm going to defend LGBTQIA rights to my dying days. I'm going to defend abortion rights to my dying days. And you said one thing about the weakest link. The weakest link in this city is the inability. It, it, the city hall has not done anything to protect the weakest people here. That means we have to house the unsheltered people and we have to help in harm reduction. Those are very critical. And that's what we need to do. Pastor Underwood Foreman. All right. Time to get down to business because we can, you know, we can be up here and we can talk and say what we're going to do, but it's time out for talking about it and start being about it. Now, I want, I got my paper here because I need to read because I want to be able to say everything uh, that, that I need to say here. When I am elected, I will push for policies that's going to ensure the well-being of the people of Peoria, not just for the South End, but all people. That's what at large mean, all of Peoria. I'm going to champion for new businesses, new restaurants, safety, food desert, fixing our messed up roads, lighting, and housing. I am going to be your voice to speak for you. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Change Peoria, for having this. Um, really, my, my biggest goal uh, running for city council is, you know, it's kind of described in a picture. I don't know if you guys have seen it, where these three little kids are looking at a baseball game, and you see the fence is really tall. The smaller kid is down here just looking at the fence. The middle kid is just looking at the fence, and the taller kid can see over. And then they talk about equity, right? So what they do is they put two crates beneath the smaller kid and one crate in the middle kid and the tall kid doesn't need a crate. And everybody says, oh, that's the end of it. It's, it's equitable now. It's fine. My job is to say, remove the damn fence. Why do we have to play in politics to put a crate here and put a crate there and put a crate here? That should not be conversations we have around a horseshoe in a debate to say, do we need to buy a hotel or we need to de determine how do we cure violence? Like we can walk and chew gum at the same time. The young lady I talked about committed suicide because we had those conversations. And as city council members, we need to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Thank you. All right. Oh, oh, y'all didn't give me no energy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Chris McCall, for 
being the moderator today. Give him a hand. He did a phenomenal job. I want to say thank you to Ryan for being a fierce leader of Change Peoria. We met several years ago, and he was like, hey, I want you to join this thing called Change Peoria. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> and we've been inseparable ever since. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ezra. If it sounds good in here today with the mics and the sound, that was all Ezra. So he also uh, took lots of photos. So they will go up on Change Peoria's page. And you all can look for photos of your favorite candidates. Uh, please remember that early voting starts February 23rd. Yes, so please, if you like what you heard today, go give these candidates your votes. Don't forget that this is a cumulative voting cycle. So that means each person gets five votes. So if you want to give one candidate all five of your votes, you will only select their name. If you want to split your vote and give multiple candidates your vote, you will select each one of their names until you get to those five votes. Okay, um, am I missing anything? Thank you to Chanel, who's also on the board. Thank you, Sincere, for volunteering and keeping time. You were on it. Um, and to David back there, the live stream looks amazing. I kept checking it throughout the event. So make sure you go share it. Tell your friends about it, and let's really get people um, open and engaged in our electoral cycles here in Peoria. Um, this is Euphoria Area Arts and Dance Studio. So, of course, I'm happy that all of you support the arts. <laughs> um, if you want to know more about this space, you can go to euphoriapeoria.com, and Ryan is going to close us out. Thanks, Shama. Uh, Shama. The, the place looks great. I really appreciate you letting us use it. Um, it's, it's an awesome place. I'm glad you found it. So, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming as well, uh, and definitely for the candidates, one for running for office and then for coming today. I really appreciate that. It was a good uh, conversation. Uh, and my uh, friend Yvonne mentioned earlier, if you look back at the history of Peoria, and what the makeup of the council looked like, and what it looks like now, and what it's going to look like after this election. Wow, what a big change right there. Yeah. It's already stepped towards the change. So I want to thank you all for running. Uh, I know it's a tough job, and um, thank you for doing it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Change.